close to the starting of the session now. It's going to be eight o'clock now in India, 8 p.m. IST. So let's start the session. I would invite uh, Dr. Sangra Subramanian as the to chair the session and uh, yeah, Ravinder Banyal will chair the session on facilities, developments in adoptive optics and spectropolarimetry. So we have um, for two hours, all our invited talks. Let me invite Shankar to start the session. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all of you, because we are covering uh, the whole world. Uh, so uh, let's let us start this session on facilities, projects, developments in adaptive optics and spectroperimetry. So we have four talks: uh, two from India and two from uh, outside of India, which are relevant to our uh, Indian facilities. Um, so each talk is for 30 minutes. Uh, what I would uh, suggest is I will give you a give you a uh, warning around 22 minutes, and then probably you can wrap it up around 25 minutes. So we have five minutes for discussion and questions. So let me call the first speaker, uh, Shibu Matthew, on multi-application solar telescope from Raipur Solar Observatory. Shibu. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so shall I? Share the screen now. Yes, please. You can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. So I will uh, share the screen. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, you can, okay. Uh, you can go to slide for more. Uh, yeah, I will. Uh, yeah, so now it's fine, right? Yeah, good. Oh, the, okay, the, the, the work which I plan to present is about uh, multi-application solar telescope, uh, giving an update on the, the telescope itself. Then I will uh, give a little bit uh, idea about the back-end instruments which we have at present, uh, some of the observations and then uh, future plans. So the team, uh, the instrumentation team, uh, team and observation, actually the team members are uh, here. And the PA is, actually I can see the PA sitting there. So Bengita uh, Krishnan is there, I could uh, see him. So this is the, the uh, plan. So what I will give you is, a, uh, is an idea about the, the telescope. So the, uh, this telescope actually we bought from uh, Amos uh, Belgium, which is a 50 centimeter of axis telescope. Of axis is basically for uh, producing the scattered light. So we have a 50 centimeter uh, of axis mirror uh, and the, the output beam accuracy is on lambda by 12 by uh, 630 nanometers. Uh, so we have a uh, secondary mirror, which is uh, based on an active uh, hexa port. It can be adjusted uh, for any kind of flexure or any kind of uh, uh, differential uh, uh, expansion of the, the telescope structure. We also have thermal control for the entire telescope. The primary, secondary, and then uh, up to M4 is thermally controlled uh, by using uh, air and uh, uh, chilled water circulation. So we have precise uh, relative encoders, which can give up to an accuracy of around 0.2 arc seconds repeatability. And the output beam goes to a stable platform. Uh, I will show you the, the, the Telescope, uh, sorry, the uh, the telescope. So the telescope is actually situated on a collapsible dome. So this dome is uh, made of uh, uh, tensile fabric. So the telescope is situated just below the, the collapsible dome. So the dome completely opens up, and the telescope comes to the the outside uh, ambient uh, conditions. Uh, so you can see the 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 primary mirror here. So the beam goes to the secondary and then comes down to uh, a position here, which takes the, uh, the, the image to the observing floor, which is here. So here, I think yeah, you can see the, uh, the, the beam coming to M6, uh, to the, the, uh, the, uh, the lower mirror, and then that goes to the, the instruments, back end instruments there. Let me just, I, I am unable, okay. So this is the, the M6, 
which brings the light to the back end instrument. So what we have is we have uh, four ports for this telescope, output four ports for this telescope. So what we can do is we can rotate this M6 mirror to any of this port and uh, get the images or the collimated beam to that port. So here uh, I am just, I just marked two ports. One is the port one, which is H alpha and G band image, which is uh, kind of fixed the uh, uh, G1 reference filter and the uh, Halle H alpha Halle filter. Uh, G1 reference filter is around 10 angstroms and the Halle filter is around 500 milli angstrom. So this gives you simultaneous photospheric and chromospheric observation in the H alpha and G band. So when you want to take the beam to the narrow band image, the, which is there in the port 2, narrow band image and polymeter and arthritics, so you just move the M6 mirror to port 2. So I will. Uh, Tell you about some of the observations. So we take regular observations with the alpha and G band imager, which I already told you about. The, uh, 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 which I already told you the G band imager is around 10 angstrom band pass, and the alpha is around 500 milli angstrom pass band. So what we do is actually we follow active regions and record solar activity regularly. Simultaneous observation and the photosphere and chromosphere, uh, which can be obtained at a, with around 0.3 arc second resolution during good seeing condition. So this doesn't have a active mirror, uh, sorry, the adaptive uh, system, but can give very good images uh, when the seeing is good with a kind of resolution of 0.3 arc second uh, uh, kind of uh, resolution. So we do uh, data archival and storage. So data available to this website and the final process images are available for uh, scientific studies. So here I give you a few examples for the observations, which is uh, which are taken recently. So this is taken around at, uh, on 3rd December 2020 and then uh, 26th December 2020. So you can see the quality of the, the images that we uh, get from these kind of observations. So next, we also have a full disk telescope. Okay, I'm just telling you about this is not uh, installed in the mass telescope, but this telescope said to the purpose of tracking the active. So what we do is actually we used to get uh, images from uh, going to track the active region. So we have a full disk far image, which can give a very good G band images. And then we use this G band images for uh, as a reference for uh, tracking the active regions using the mass uh, uh, telescope. So we have this observations taken and almost like every one minute uh, for these two uh, wave ones, G band and uh, TAO band. And this is also available for uh, synoptic studies. And uh, mainly this is used for uh, the tracking purpose uh, in the case of uh, master observations. So now I will uh, come to the, the port two, which I showed you in the the, the uh, but, uh, the, the, in this image. So here, this is the port two, where you can see the collimated beams and there's the uh, objective, which is around two meter uh, focal length. So what you get is you get an image uh, uh, of six arc width field of view here, and then it goes to the adaptive optic system, which is installed uh, at this place. And then it goes to, from the two, two the adaptive optics, it goes to the, the narrow band image where you can see two FPs, stable period at loan sitting at these uh, 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 locations. So this, is, this shows you the optical instrument layout. So as I told you, the M, uh, light goes to the M6 meter, then it gets reflected by M1, and then uh, there is a uh, folding mirror, which can be inserted into the beam, when the seeing is very bad, we normally don't use the adaptive optics, so we can just rotate this mirror, flip the mirror, and then uh, get the light directly, for example, for any kind of uh, uh, testing and other purpose, we just directly get the image the, the filter. Always it goes to the adaptive optics system. So we have an adaptive optics system with a shark command sensor plus tip tilt mirror and deformable mirror. So it goes to that, and then it goes to the, the imaging system. So what we have here is two February tetalons, FP1 and FP2, and uh, in between we have a dichoric B splitter, and we have uh, two channels with uh, two different P filters. So what we have is this dichoric, dichoric beam splitter splitting the light 
for uh, 6173 nanometer and 8542 nanometer wavelengths. So we put the pre-filters in that path for 8542 and 6173, and then get almost simultaneous images for these two two wavelengths. So for 8542 nanometer, we use only one FP, which is uh, good enough because of the line is very broad, and uh, this FP one gives you around uh, 170 milli angstrom uh, pass band. There is FP for 6173 for the narrow line, so we use both FP one and FP two in tandem, and uh, that gives you around 70 milli angstrom. Pass band uh, through the 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 the, uh, the pre filter. So we also have a polarimeter which is now inserted just behind the pre filter, very close to the the uh, 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 CCD. So I will uh, tell a little bit more about uh, the adaptive optic system. So as I told you, we have uh, the adaptive optic system now working somewhat satisfactorily. So what we have is a tilted mirror plus a sharp Hartmann. Wave front sensor uh, with 37 nanometer uh, deformable mirror, capable to load the system to transports and ports. So here I show you some of the images. So, uh, uh, so uh, basically, Daya Baina is working on this, and uh, I show you some of the movie which he provided uh, me. So this is uh, another movie which shows you some the, the stability of the system. So here, okay. Uh, the top actually what we see is uh, average of 512 images in 48 seconds without the AO, and the same observation uh, taken in a different channel with the the AO system, low pass system. So now actually most of the observations we take is through this AO system. So and uh, I will once the light passes through, comes through the AO to goes to the narrow band imager. So what we have here is. Uh, for the narrow band imager is two linear nearby tetrons so as i told you we have two separate channels for 6173 and 8542 nanometers where the dichroic mesh filter just divides so the as i i already told about this so the the, uh, the, the lower uh, uh, the image shows you the linear nearby fiber tetron which is similar to the one used in uh, solar orbit very similar to that so what we have is a 60 mm aperture tetron And then uh, this is the bare tone that we bought, and then we made the the thermal uh, enclosure and also the the power supplies for this. So this works at uh, high voltages. For example, we use minus plus or minus 2,500 volts to tune the atlons to different wavelengths. So these atlons are electrically tunable. So what you can do is you, once you, once you tune the atlon the line center, so you can. Tune uh, or you can uh, apply voltages and tune the atlons to both the sides of the the line center line pins. So I will show you some of the examples for this. So for the narrow band imager, as I told you, we can get simultaneous observations of this. Choose a widget, ideal widget for uh, the iron one and calcium measurements. So what we have, you can see that actually we can select the wavelengths and then uh, wavelength shapes. A lot of things we can select here. And then uh, we can select the uh, the uh, uh, the number of sets, and then uh, uh, leave for the the observations. That is kind of automated uh, observing uh, program, which is written here. So there are a lot of op several options. So we can uh, set the wavelength uh, steps. So to optimize the the the, the timing and all, we can set the steps. How many steps you we need, and then uh, we can also do a line center combination. For example, when we observe. Uh, Distant and uh, the limb, so the uh, the because of the uh, rotation, different solar rotation, the wavelength sh shifts happens, and then you can maybe if you want to get a get a symmetric uh, wavelength coverage, so you can just get a line center computation and then uh, set the wavelength. So there are several uh, 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 parameters which you can set for uh, optimizing the 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 observations. So here I show. One example of one of the observation or a movie which scanned the the calcium line profile from uh, from we can't cover the entire uh, line so because of the uh, uh, the limitation applying uh, voltages we can't 
apply very large voltage because we can go only up to plus or minus 2500 volts we can cover only plus or minus 0.5 angstrom from the across the line center so we may not be able to go to the calcium 8542 uh, continue but we can kind of cover uh, a very good range uh, in the calcium uh, line so this shows you the images and then the wavelength position obtained uh, with a scan. So now I will uh, show you another uh, observation which is taken on uh, 23rd February. I'll just take this as an example and tell you uh, what the, how the timing and uh, how what is the kind of optimum time which we, with which we can get the observation. So this uh, observation is taken uh, maybe a few days back. So this of the whole observation around uh, takes uh, we took around 20 sets of observations which took around uh, 32 minutes so we just had set 25 wavelength points in calcium 2 and 17 wavelength points in uh, iron 1 line uh, with the for the single set it took around 80 seconds okay now to reduce the timing we can still reduce the the wavelength points for example, uh, 17 bevel point is may not be needed for uh, iron line. So depending upon the the requirement, you can always kind of reduce the bevel points and uh, optimize the the timings. So these observations were taken with the uh, AO stabilized under moderate seeing, and I'm just putting only a snapshot from one of the. It's not a best uh, frame, but I'm just taking one, one snapshot and then putting it uh, here. So just to understand about the the timing. So this is the line profile, which is the average for the entire field of view for the uh, for the uh, for the 20 sets. So this C, okay, also just wavelength points with number of wavelength. So this is around 25 wavelength position and then repeated for around 20 times. So this is the, uh, the top one is the calcium and the bottom one is the iron one line taken almost like simultaneous. You can say, I will show you the the meaning of simultaneous, I can uh, so because of the, the si simultaneous means we may not be able to apply the exact voltages. For example, like when we take calcium and uh, iron one images, the FPs need slightly different voltages. So what we do is actually we compute the voltages required for FP one and FP two for calcium and iron one, and then we sort the voltages and then we start taking the images in the in a sorted volt voltage, volt sorted voltage mode. So the iron one and the calcium two requires slightly different voltages. So the image of question may not be done exactly at the same time for iron one and calcium two. So I, I think next, uh, okay, next uh, uh, this will uh, show you the the uh, the timings. So this is the the timing in seconds. So what you have is one thousand. 169, which is around 32 minutes. So the next next time I go through. So this is the calcium one line profile. So when the calcium one line, so the images it's almost like uh, to the, towards the end of the calcium one image acquisition. So the iron one starts. So if you have more uh, wavelength uh, coverage for calcium one, then uh, some of the images will fall. So within uh, 60, I think 70 seconds. So you get both iron and uh, calcium one images, but there is a slight uh, gap between the, the images. So that's not perfectly simultaneous, but it's very close to uh, to uh, the, uh, the close timings for the, both the images. So this is only three sets I'm just showing. So another uh, observation what we did recently uh, is uh, this is observation uh, which we took on 26th February uh, this month, maybe a few days back. So here, what we did is actually we try to. So uh, since we did, uh, since we can obtain uh, good images with the uh, the imager uh, along with the adaptive optics. So now we started to obtain. Okay, we started to integrate uh, the polarimeter along with this. So we started to get stable images and then started to get the the good strokes. Uh, signals. So here, uh, this uh, image in the left shows the Stokes V by I measurement for one particular wavelength taken on uh, 26 February 2021. So in this case, actually 30 images in I plus V and I minus V 
for 17 bavalent points are measured. So this is, I think, uh, uh, close to, I think, uh, maybe 20 million angstrom away from the line center, this image. Uh, could be, yeah, 20 or 30 million angstrom away from the line center. So this image is, is also measured simultaneously with the uh, calcium image. So with uh, photospheric uh, a line profile, so what we can obtain uh, now at present is the photospheric uh, complete line profile images plus photospheric uh, strokes I and B. So now uh, it will be kind of upgraded to I, uh, the other, all the other uh, uh, Q and U parameters. And then uh, calcium line profile, complete line profile. Uh, this at uh, for the, the earlier observation, when we take I plus B and I minus B observations, what we do is we change the, so what we use is actually we use uh, liquid crystal, so polarimeter, uh, in our case the polarimeter is uh, two liquid crystal very vertices and a linear polarizer. So we apply, change the voltage. For example, I plus B, we change the voltage of the liquid crystal variable retarder to a particular specific voltage and then uh, keep 20, 30 images in that case without changing the, the LCBR voltage and then I minus B image. Uh, 430 images and then out of the the uh, I plus B and I minus B image to get the Stokes B parameters. So these are the kind of observations at present what we have. So we plan to upgrade this to uh, all the other uh, Stokes parameters. Uh, so now with the narrowband uh, imaging in calcium and iron one, the Tayo indicated with the narrowband image for image stabilization and seeing condition. So we obtained that several uh, data sets uh, in the last uh, observing season. As I told you, the simultaneous spectral scans in uh, uh, CA calcium 1 and 6173 with a temporal currents better than 1 mean we can obtain now. So now this data set are being reduced and analyzed for understanding the some of the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 science which we can do with this is the ever shed effect in photospheric and uh, inverse ever shed in chromosphere. So this is now being corrected and uh, being in, in bed, so some of the data we are inverting with nickel code. So to understand the, the, the this kind of uh, studies. So uh, to just to tell you how we obtain. So this is on uh, image from uh, Sora HMI. So we have the same, uh, so we can scale the images to the uh, uh, SDHMI uh, images. So we, if you see, this is the double ground from the uh, from the SDHMI image, and this is the same region, the bisector Doppler gram from the calcium image obtained from uh, Udaipur. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm also almost finished. Yeah. So another uh, addition, new addition is another uh, spectrograph, uh, which is a and uh, shamrock spectrograph. So this is an off-the-shelf spectrograph which is bought for uh, tuning the filter. So we thought we will uh, use it for uh, some kind of, uh, uh, use it as a scanning spectrograph. So we just installed the whole spectrograph on the top of a uh, scanning mechanism. And then uh, we can scan uh, the six argument field of view with a very good uh, accuracy. So I will just show you a typical example of the scan. So the scanning spectrograph. So this is the spectrograph tool that to a alpha wavelength portion, so you can see a romance. So this is actually uh, sitting in the port three of the telescope where you don't have uh, any adaptive optic system. So if you put an active mirror, you may not see this kind of uh, small jet. So this can be used for uh, kind of scanning broad lines, uh, uh, chromospheric lines, H uh, alpha and uh, magnesium B lines. So you can already see uh, the 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 force and counter force in the the prominences. Yes, so it's a very raw uh, spectrograph image, which is again uh, so on 6th uh, January. We just started to get this one. So with uh, this, the future plan is actually, as I told you, we are keeping the polarimeter in the observing floor just before the, uh, the detector. So since this is a off axis telescope, also a lot of mirrors are used to steer the beam to the observing floor. So we are almost around eight mirrors, which is steering the 
the beam to the observing floor. So a lot of uh, instrumental polarization or very instrumental polarization introduced by the telescope. So in order to avoid those kind of instrumental polarization, so to minimize the effect of instrumental polarization, what we plan to do is we plan to install the, the polarimeter just after the, the secondary mirror. So we already installed it last year, but instead of because of the difficulty in getting a linear polarizer, we had to shift it again. So we are getting a linear polarizer, uh, uh, the very good quality linear polarizer from Motorola. And now we will be shifting the polarimeter close to the secondary mirror so that actually only uh, uh, polarization from the uh, instrument polarization introduced by the primary and secondary mirror will be uh, passing through the polarimeter before it gets analyzed. So that is one thing which we are planning to do. Hopefully, we will, this observing season itself, we will uh, put it. And then, uh, so we are also producing the data and analyzing it to get the, the some of the some results actually from that. So that is all actually from my side. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shibu, for uh, the nice uh, coverage of what MUST can do. Um, I see there are a few questions uh, in the chat box. Yeah. I'll just read out. Uh, one from Sridharan. Sridharan, can you unmute and uh, ask your question? Yeah, uh, Shibu, very nice talk. I actually was wanted to know the field of view of the AO corrected images you showed. Uh, uh, okay, well, I am showing the, the, the whole field of view, what we observe, okay. So this okay. is around uh, more than uh, 4.5 arc minutes, okay. The AO can't correct that much, uh, as you know, it's maybe 15, 20 arc seconds. So we are actually the, the sunspot which we show. So the AO is constantly in that part only. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, there was another question from Luis Bello. Can you unmute, unmute and speak? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Shibu. Um, so the FPIs you are using uh, come from CSIRO or it's, other? It's, it's from uh, CSIRO, Australia, which uh, unfortunately they stopped making anymore. So they are not doing it. Nowadays, so this uh, uh, FPs are actually okay. We, this is we bought at uh, uh, much earlier than uh, the solar orbiter uh, FP. So we got two of them from uh, CSIRO, it's around 60 millimeter aperture. 60? Six, 60, six oh yeah, it's millimeters, yeah. Okay, okay, uh huh, great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? You can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself. Uh, Shibu, I have a couple of uh, questions. One is, uh, uh, I, I see a very nice uh, add-on to the mass on this uh, uh, prominence uh, studies, the, the instrument you have recently put in. What is the yeah, yeah. resolution, spectral resolution, and spatial resolution? Uh, this is actually okay. This is a uh, standard channel 750 uh, spectrogram, which we bought for uh, kind of basically for uh, uh, filter tuning and all. Okay. So this is actually uh, 250 milli angstrom, uh, maybe at uh, 630 nanometer. That is a spectral resolution. So that you can uh, use this for any kind of uh, uh, observations in photospheric lens. With, for the uh, for example, 617, you may not be able to use it because it's only 250 milli angstrom. But for the broader chromospheric lines, for example, H alpha, we may be able to use it, and that is giving a kind of good results. Yeah. You and even we have your uh, spectrograph there. So uh, we, we have another, uh, two more spectrographs uh, there. But this will be a kind of we'll be able to use it for any any lines. Okay. That is, uh, yeah. So what we did is actually we just installed this on a uh, scanning uh, table, uh, very similar to what you have in Kodaikana, if you remember. So the whole spectrograph, whole spectrograph moves. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we use a new port uh, state to move the spectrogram. Yeah. I'm just find 10, micro, 10 micron steps. I'm just looking at this as a kind of a add on to the suit instrument on board Aditya, which. Mm -hmm. No, this is actually, uh, that's what, this is actually a raw spectrum which we just obtained a few days back and then uh, just put uh, the things together. But if you have a tip tilt mirror, at least working in this beam, then uh, definitely we will get very good images from that. And I, and, have one, yeah. and I have one more on the polarimeter. Now I understand yes, you're sure. up front in that. So your yeah. polarimeter is single beam or dual beam? Or that? 
please. Uh, single beam, single beam. Okay. Single beam. Uh, so it's basically it's a it's a uh, uh, polarizing beam uh, cube actually, which is there on the in the back. Okay. I have one more question. Can I ask Shankar? Yeah. Yeah, Shibu, what is the cadence of the AO corrected narrowband images you have? So the, the cadence actually is, uh, uh, I, I'll show you, actually the, uh, for example, like the I plus V and I minus V images part V2. So the cadence is, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, so, uh, 150 milliseconds between each images. Okay. Okay. That is only the, the so the problem actually when we put the arrow, what you do is actually you lose a lot of photons. Mm -hmm. Here uh, it used to be 50 millisecond exposed time we used to give for uh, V and I minus V. So now we have to increase it to 150 uh, But we can get it, like that is the exposed time is the cadence. I think the cameras are very fast. Okay. And so we, for the for a G band images, direct images, it could be much faster than. Much faster, much faster. So the actually, for example, if I remove the FP and the, don't remove the FP, but if I remove the blocking filter and I put a door band, a very broad glass filter in, uh, behind the the FP, and if I take image, it's done to three, four milliseconds. That is the cadence. What you can get? Thirty images per second we can get. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Shibu, and uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, let us move on to the next one. Uh, for those who want to discuss and ask questions, we have a Slack channel uh, as well as you can type it in the chat box. Uh, Shibu is there. He, he will answer them. Let me now request Ravinder Banyal to uh, introduce the speaker, next speaker, and uh, carry on the program. Ravinder? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me, Shankar? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. So our second speaker for this session is Professor B. Ravindra from Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. Uh, he's going to talk about NLST, which is India's two meter proposed national large solar telescope. Uh, Ravindra, you will have 25 minutes to speak and I will let you know three minutes before your time ends. So maybe you can start now. Yeah. Share Thank you. Screen. Thank you. I'll uh, talk about uh, the India's uh, large solar telescope uh, on behalf of the NLST team, which is uh, led, led by Indian Institute of Astrophysics. So here, just I will tell you the background, how it all started. In uh, 2007, uh, uh, this proposal was uh, made. We need to have a two-meter class uh, uh, large solar telescope, this was uh, proposed. Then soon after that, uh, site characterization started at uh, three locations in Himalayas. Uh, one is at uh, Hanley, there we have a two meter class telescope. And then uh, another one is at Mirak, I will uh, talk about it later. And one more in um, Devastal, this is uh, close to Nainital. So after that, uh, Mirak was identified, that is near the Pangang Lake, uh, uh, was identified as the best site for NLST. And uh, then we have prepared a detailed concept design uh, report. Uh, uh, after that, we have submitted uh, the report to our funding agency. The funding agency uh, took it. And in uh, 2019, they have given uh, some amount of uh, money to uh, procure the land at the uh, near the Pangong So Lake. And then, uh, and then they have circulated our uh, documents to various our government departments, and we have received the comments, uh, and so on. It went on. Now the we are in the final stage of uh, uh, this project. Uh, we are expecting uh, uh, the final uh, meeting. It can happen sometime in mid of 2021, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll tell you uh, what and all next uh, steps uh, after that. Uh, what we need to do. So what is a NLST? NLST is a National Large Solar Telescope. Uh, it's a two meter class telescope with, a, with a innovative design that will provide a front ranking international facility for observations uh, of the sun. What is the choice of uh, this uh, two meter class uh, aperture is based on? It's based on the scientific uh, objectives. Uh, 
and also it is based on the high optical throughput. Scientific objective is so we want to do high, uh, we want to observe the sun at the highest possible uh, resolution to resolve the subarcs and magnetic elements. And um, the diffraction limit of this two meter class telescope is 0.05 arc second at 5000 angstrom. And the pressure scale height, photon mean fraud, and uh, observing fundamental length scales need 0.1 arc second for imaging, 0.05 arc second for studying dynamics, uh, uh, dynamics happening in the solar atmosphere. Spectropolarimetry is the another one. It is a photon starved at high resolution. So it requires at least a two meter aperture uh, to get a good signal to noise ratio. So if you have a uh, um, two meter class telescope with the minimum number of uh, reflecting surfaces, we will definitely get this uh, high optical uh, throughput. And the uh, choice of this two meter class telescope is based on the tested design and technology. In the past, uh, uh, so, so few of the telescopes were made like, and it's operating now. And uh, one can realize the project uh, uh, in a short time scale, and um, uh, it can also keep the cost uh, uh, less. So, main benefits of uh, uh, having it uh, uh, having a large telescope at Indian soil is it will fill the it will fill the longitudinal gap. You already have a, a telescope at uh, Hawaii with a dickist and good SLA, uh, solar telescope, and then Gregor already, they are all operating. But in the Indian longitude or uh, in this longitude, we don't have uh, any large telescope. And if we have, we can, it can cover, uh, we can cover it up. Uh, the continuous observation of the sun can be made over the longitude. And uh, it can uh, enable cutting edge research to be carried out uh, with a frontline international uh, facility. And broad scientific uh, goals uh, we would like to carry out with uh, the uh, uh, large solar telescope is uh, the uh, these are the some of the things can be addressed is a magnetic field generation and solar under solar cycle understanding the dynamo origin of it nature of the solar cycle all uh, uh, all can be worked uh, worked on using those data and one can uh, try to understand the magnetic coupling between the interior and the solar atmosphere. Lo local heliososmology at high resolution, uh, measurement of the weak magnetic fields in the intra network and quiet prominences can be carried out, thermal structure of the chromosphere, energetic phenomena and activities such as uh, flares, uh, coronal mass ejections. So these are the, some of the things uh, we can uh, list it out. Uh, to be a little bit uh, specifically, uh, uh, the generation of this uh, magnetic field uh, uh, can be understood using the uh, uh, through uh, global. accurately measured on the sun. So NLST will uh, fulfill such requirement to facilitate uh, uh, answering the following questions pertaining to the above aspects of the solar dynamo. How do the convective flows associated turbulent uh, turbulent stretch twist and hold the local small scale magnetic fields? And how do such processes change the magnetic flux budget locally and globally? How do large, uh, uh, how do strong large scale fields uh, uh, such as in sunspots, filaments, etc., interact with small scale fields. How do large scale uh, convective uh, and meridional flows advert, diffuse, and diffuse the magnetic field? Some such things uh, can be addressed. And uh, these are the high resolution images. Uh, and already uh, the Swedish Solar Telescope, it was uh, observed the dark cold filaments, uh, uh, dark cold uh, penumbral filaments. Uh, 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 some uh, uh, 15 years ago, and then uh, the uh, and there are uh, uh, light bridges. Uh, this uh, this could be uh, very dynamic uh, in the and when once you see it at high resolution, you see them as a very dynamic uh, 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 dynamic processes are happening. And one such example is here here uh, near the uh, near the uh, light bridge. There there is a uh, there is an ejection uh, of uh, this jet, 
and at the same uh, location in the iris image there were the brightness so these are the things uh, one can uh, address the uh, one can observe with a large solar telescope at high resolution at different uh, layers uh, in the solar atmosphere and uh, one more example is uh, uh, yeah, i'm showing it here uh, with a large solar telescope one can carry out the multivalent observations um, uh, from at various layers of uh, small scale features as well as uh, large scale features uh, uh, and the question is uh, next question can be is there is there any something uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, structure uh, below the 70 kilometer so the magnetic field increases from the quiet sun to sun spots as the magnetic field increases there will be a horizontal scale of the convection decreases convective energy transport decreases and the question comes that how much of this structure can we hope to detect so these are the some of the images uh, showing it here with a 50 cm telescope we will be able to resolve the granulation as you go to 1 meter class telescope you will be able to see this uh, on the uh, periphery of the granulation there are bright uh, points and uh, when you have a 2 meter class telescope you will be able to resolve those uh, and with the larger telescope their contrast will be much better uh, thing so so it turns out that 2 meter is the minimum aperture of a telescope where uh, processes at sub arc second start become indetectable so we would like to have a 2 meter class uh, telescope for that we have carried out a, a site survey at uh, several uh, at the three locations in himalayas i already told you and those are the places, one in Devastal, another one is Hanley, and one more in uh, Mirak near Pangong, so Lake. After uh, several, um, after uh, uh, detailed uh, site survey, we chose uh, the site near the Pangong, so Lake uh, is the best site. This is the location I am telling, this is the incursion site. Uh, in the Pangong So Lake, and this is the larger view of it, and this is the village, Mirak village. So we have put our site survey instruments uh, in that location, and uh, this uh, and this uh, Mirak village. It is located at a height of uh, 4.3 kilometer above the sea level in the Changtang Coal Desert, and uh, this incursion site is uh, in the uh, Pangong So Lake. Yeah. in the Leda, Leh Ladakh region. Its width is about 2 to 5 kilometer. At the largest uh, width some, in some of the places is about uh, 5 kilometer. And uh, this is about 130 kilometer long lake. It's, uh, the location is about 175 kilometer from Leh Ladakh. And uh, this location is 2 kilometer from the village that is the Mirak village. And we have put our site survey instruments such as solar differential image, motion monitor, shadow band ranger, and scintillometer, weather, all those things, along with the uh, automatic weather station, all sky camera. Uh, uh, we have all this data for about uh, 10 years, weather station data, all sky camera data for 10 years. And um, three years ago, we have installed one uh, small uh, 20 centimeter telescope, which can make the observation of the sun in uh, Hachalpa. Uh, wavelength. So these are the some of the results. Uh, we have carried out uh, uh, SDIM, uh, SDIM uh, uh, observations uh, in 2008 and in uh, 2009. The median seeing it shows about uh, 5.6 um, uh, centimeter. And uh, here is the Shabar instrument uh, result. Uh, X axis is uh, height above the ground, and uh, this is the median uh, or not. And as you see it here, after 20 meters, it's almost uh, kind of uh, saturated or it slowly increases uh, in uh, R0 value. And uh, wind in all the seasons, uh, what we see is it is in the northwesterly uh, direction in the most of the time of the year. This is along the lake direction. And uh, uh, here is the plot for uh, humidity. And uh, the uh, the red one is for our site. It is about 40% 40 uh, 40 of uh, relative humidity most of the time of the year. But in the winter, it uh, decreases. Um, so here we are comparing it with the uh, other site, uh, uh, world-class site. It's a Heliakala. So summary of our site survey result uh, is here. 
um, uh, our median uh, R naught uh, at six meter above the ground is about is uh, 5.8 centimeter. We have uh, annual sunshine hours is about 1,900 hours. Mean uh, humidity level is about 40 percent, and mean wind speed uh, is about uh, 3.4 uh, meter per second. And here are some comparison with the other uh, sites around the world. And the number of corrected uh, annual hour uh, in, in terms of two hour uh, blocks uh, where R0 is larger than 10, 7 centimeter is, uh, is about, um, uh, it's about 89 um, such uh, uh, blocks you get it. So in uh, terms of uh, to say that the Mirac site is a good site for infrared observation of the sun as well. Uh, because of the low uh, humidity level at the site. So now coming to the optical design and the structure. Uh, so these are the optical uh, requirements uh, we had when we proposed the telescope. Aperture is a two meter class uh, aperture. Uh, it is a three, uh, three, mirror, three mirror on axis Gregorian. Field of view is a 300 arc uh, second. And the wavelength of operation is uh, near UV to near infrared uh, region. And the polariz polarization accuracy is about 10 power minus 4. And the spatial resolution is 0.1 or second at uh, 5000 angstrom. These are the, our requirements when we propose the telescope. And here is uh, some of the optical design. I am showing it here. And um, this is the primary, secondary. And uh, here is a heat top. And the polarimeter package is kept just before the uh, secondary focus. And the tip tilt uh, is uh, tip tilt and uh, deformable mirrors are kept on the, uh, along the elevation axis. It is a part of the integral part of the telescope. And uh, this is the, uh, the ZMAC design of uh, the telescope. And again, this is the primary, secondary, and then uh, deformable. These are the adaptive optics. This is the polarimeter package. And this is the final focus here. So totally, there are about uh, six, uh, uh, six mirror before the final focus. And uh, this adaptive optics is kept uh, at, uh, along the in the in the elevation axis where the beam is elliptical. Uh, uh, that has to be. and wavefront sensor uh, is uh, here. And this is, here is the science beam where before that it is tapped. And the number of uh, actuators are uh, about 560 actuators and sub apertures. Uh, uh, number of sub apertures uh, uh, along the telescope direction is about uh, 532. And um, here, here is uh, just to show we have worked out uh, the telescope uh, uh, building, dome, and other thing. Uh, uh, here, the telescope will be kept at a height of about 20 meters above the about the ground and uh, and uh, the, this is the altazimuth mount so that there will be image rotation to compensate for that we have a uh, image uh, this instrument rotation table here uh, this is just uh, one or two floor below the uh, telescope and this is the telescope uh, altazimuth mount and you see this uh, it's a um, it's a open dome uh, structure uh, what we have worked out uh, and uh, some of the design we have worked out for the open dome, open dome uh, structure. And uh, this one um, uh, is uh, comes out to be the best because of the power consumption, time to open and close the dome, cost, all those things. Uh, based on that, we have uh, chosen uh, this one. And uh, this will uh, this will completely open and comes down below uh, and goes below the uh, below the uh, uh, the floor. Now, what are the focal plane instruments uh, we have planned? Uh, in the first light, we have planned um, uh, three, uh, uh, three uh, backend instruments. One is the broadband imaging system and uh, the, the narrowband imaging system based on this. Uh, this is a Fabry-Perot based uh, narrowband imaging system and high resolution spectrograph along with the polarimeter. And there will be a free port available for attaching any other instrument. In the second phase, uh, we are extending this capability, or we are planning to extend this capability uh, for the infrared observations, uh, uh, especially uh, the uh, polarimeter uh, uh, and spectrograph uh, instrument will be made uh, for especially for this. Uh, and the broadband imaging uh, system that is the BBIS 
is a multispectral imaging system for achieving high spatial resolution, high temporal resolution, and our target is to observe and study rapid evolution of small scale feature at very high spatial resolution and the temporal resolution at multi heights in the solar atmosphere. And um, uh, there will be a, uh, simultaneously four, eight to four wavelengths uh, one can observe. This is the wavelength of those band pass of the filters and what are the regions and uh, what are the targets uh, can be observed is all listed here. So G band calcium 2K titanium oxide and H beta in um, photospheric and chromospheric lines uh, we have chosen. This is a one with the one set of uh, uh, one set and other set uh, if you want then blue continuum CN band calcium 2 IR line that is 8542 and H alpha. Uh, so this is the another uh, set for the photosphere and the chromosphere. Uh, uh, observations. Uh, this can be carried out uh, in this um, using this broadband imaging system. And uh, this is the uh, just uh, optical layout of those. And uh, here uh, uh, in this uh, in this path, two cameras are there with uh, two filters. And in this path, uh, there are two two filters. Uh, so totally simultaneously, we can observe in four wavelengths. Uh, and the narrow band imaging system is a this is uh, this is used to observe the sun at, um, uh, uh, by scanning the uh, scanning the line profile uh, uh, of the photosphere and chromospheric uh, lines uh, and uh, uh, our specifications are like this we have worked out for the thing and uh, this is a dual uh, fabry perot based narrow band imaging system spectral resolution is about 200000 uh, and field up is uh, 1.5 arc minute and uh, cadence uh, of the images will be few frames per uh, second. And uh, this is the right side one is the uh, the uh, dual fabric perot system uh, in tandem will be kept in the collimated uh, beam. And the spectropolarimeter, these are the science goals. I will not get into this, uh, but uh, for uh, to achieve the science goals, we need to have a sensitivity of about uh, 10 power minus 4 and the polarization uh, should be better than 1% uh, before the modulation. Wavelength coverage is uh, up to near infrared and then uh, uh, wavelength resolution is uh, 20 milli angstrom and field of view will be 120 arc second uh, square. And uh, at, um, uh, we, we would like to carry out the spectropolarimeter observation at three, four wavelengths uh, uh, simultaneously. And uh, the, these are the different orders we are planning to use uh, to carry out these observations. Uh, and uh, this includes the uh, 1.5 micron as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what is the current state uh, status of uh, this thing and future plan? NS NNST will be located at Mirac and the Pangong Lake uh, Pangang uh, Lake land uh, for the site has been already procured, and the former approval uh, from the our funding agency is expected by the mid of 2021. Global tender for fabrication of the telescope will be floated once the formal clearance from our funding agency is obtained. Fabrication of the NLST is expected to begin uh, in 2022. First, if everything goes well, then first light we are expecting it in 2026. So backend instruments will be made in-house and also through external collaborations. These are the participating institutions. Nodal institution is our Indian Institute of Astrophysics. There are national part partners, physical research laboratory, here Udaipur Solar Observatory comes in, Aries at Nainital, Indian Space Research Organization, universities, IASC, ICERS and IITs. There are some international partners. So they have already shown interest. And also uh, from Queen's uh, University Belfast, they, they are planning to build one of the backend instrument uh, for this. And uh, from the Indian side, who are the people involved? From IIA, we, we have planning to focus on the telescope, focal plane instruments, and, uh, uh, and a part of the adaptive optics. Uh, science, site survey, dome building, etc. And Udaipur Solar Observatory, we already agreed to be part of this in the in building some one of the focal plane instruments. Also, uh, they would like to involve in science and data. ISER, CISRO, IITs, they are all planning to uh, involve in some of the backend instruments, science data, and also from Aries, 
they are planning to involve uh, in instruments uh, uh, development and science and data and there are uh, several phd students and postdoctoral fellows will be involved in this uh, one and uh, this is the slide uh, here on the top left what you see is the mirac village and uh, this is the uh, one incursion site where there all the uh, site survey instruments are located uh, and the uh, three years ago we have uh, they, we have installed this hl alpha telescope this is on the west side of the lake this is uh, one one of the south uh, side of the lake in the winter season you see it already uh, so much of uh, snow or ice have formed and some uh, all sky weather station installed with this i will thank you for your uh, patience uh, thank you very much Okay, uh, thanks Ravindra. Thanks for giving the latest update on NLST. Uh, the talk was well on time and we have you now um, another five minutes for questions or any other discussion. So please, uh, whoever wants to ask question, uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself and go ahead. No. Um, maybe I can ask a question. Please go ahead. Was asking. Yes. yes. Um, okay. Thanks. A very very nice presentation, uh, Ravindra. Uh, I have a question. I understand that. China is just across on the other side of the lake. Maybe the mountains we are seeing are already in China. Is that correct? Yes, it is a 10 kilometer uh, on the line of sight. Right. Yeah. Uh, has the, the, the recent tensions, you know, this last year, there were some issues along the border with China. Uh, is that having any, because of national security or anything, is the site being reconsidered or is everything? Uh, we we are uh, doing our observations. I have not heard anything from our uh, colleagues uh, working at uh, at the location. Because this, uh, whatever is happening, is about 10 kilometers away on the line of sight. But when you take uh, mountains and go around, it could be something like 25 kilometers or so. So okay. I have not heard anything uh, uh, any such bad thing. Right, because I'm just, you know, if the Indian government wants to put such expensive infrastructure uh, so close to a border where there could be tensions. But, okay, if you haven't heard, then that is good news. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Arna, uh, maybe, Arna, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Can I ask a question yeah. also? Uh, I'm following Sami. I'm worried about these mountains that you see. They are between 1,000 or 2,000 meters higher than the lake is. And so I'm worried that you may have a bad layer of turbulence high up. And if you have turbulence high up, then you get very small isoplanetic patches. So then doing AO is complicated because when the isoplanetic patch gets smaller than a granule, then you lose your wavefront encoding. So I think it will be important to have these uh, height scanning uh, gadgets for the seeing that you profile the seeing as a function of height. Uh, right now, seeing as a function of height, we have up to something like 30 meter. Uh, and then to say that these mountains are very high, and, and we have observed uh, with the, our weather station, almost all the time of the year, the wind blows from along the lake. We have not seen uh, these mountains are there on the east and west side. But what we have seen the wind blowing is in the, um, in the direction of uh, northwest all the time, along the lake, not uh, across the lake. Yeah, but do you also sample the... Uh... The turbulence layer, say, at about two kilometers up. Uh, very, very high. That, that, is, that we would like to do, but uh, that is a difficult task because yeah. of uh, it's uh, close to the border. 
anything if you want to do at higher heights and a little upgrade okay. otherwise we have plans uh, what to do and uh, with the balloons or something could be done yeah okay for the rest it looks like a fantastic site i mean uh, big bear has proven that the lake side is so much better than uh, than the uh, other ones so it looks very really good thank you Thanks, Rob. Uh, Arnav, you can go ahead and ask the question. Yeah, uh, so Ravindra, so I suppose during the winter for some months, the uh, region will be inaccessible and maybe the telescope will be uh, inoperable. So uh, can you uh, give us an idea how much will be the time when uh, uh, the telescope cannot be operated during the winter? No, no, the, the, the telescope is operated by the local uh, right, uh, right now itself. Uh, and uh, they are local people and they go there and uh, they do, they are trained for that and uh, they, they do it well. Uh, for us, it is little cold. So uh, if you if you can, uh, if you would like to go, one can go. There is no problem. I have been there in the month of December, January. So I don't see any cut in the, uh, in the road. Uh, Roads are okay. They, they're, they're, there's no problem. But it's, a, it's a, sometimes it will be a severe cold, something like uh, minus 30 degrees Celsius it can go. But normal temperature is minus 15 during winter. So I think, Ravindra, the question was that, uh, I mean, can the telescope be operated throughout the year in all conditions? Yes. Probably. So, yes. Yeah, if, if, you buy, if you buy yeah. the components according to that, definitely it can. One has to... One has to make the components uh, uh, to okay. run the telescope. And, we, and uh, the nearby place, there is a hand lay. We have a nighttime telescope. Nighttime temperatures are much less than that, and uh, it is operated uh, till now without any problems. So I had seen Luis raising the hand. So Luis, you can go ahead and unmute yourself to ask the question. Yeah, well, uh, just a comment. I was very surprised to see the mechanical structure um, and the amount of the telescope um, like that, because it seems mm, very much unbalanced. Um, what is the reason for having uh, such a, a, an uncommon um, um, setup? I, yeah, I agree with you. But when we discuss with the company, they are completely fine with that. Why do you uh, worry? Because um, with the one-sided one, uh, one, one, what they claim is that though... Uh, unbalanced, what we are saying, but they, they can be able to balance it, but it will not obstruct the wind. That's the one. If you have a two-sided one, that will obstruct the wind and you will have a uh, uh, maybe turbulence created. That's what uh, they, they give the answer The the when they designed uh, during uh, uh, some five, six years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Deepankar? Yeah, just to comment uh, with yeah. uh, Arnab's uh, point. See, the site is accessible throughout the year because it is maintained by the military. And apart from very heavy snowfall, it could be only blocked for a day or so, not more than that. And for Rob, uh, he also wanted to point out that this lake actually across it is three to four kilometers. So the mountains, what you see in the background is actually three to four kilometers away from the location where the telescope would be. So there is a substantial horizontal distance to those mountains. Thanks, Deepankar. So any other question, please? Yes, may I ask uh, another yeah, question? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, one of the first light instruments would be um, a fabri Pro instrument. Uh, do you plan to have polarimeter? Uh, to have polarimetric cap capabilities with that instrument, or or um, it's just an imaging uh, well, spectroscopic instrument? No. First, uh, we will have a spectropolarimeter. With that, uh, we, uh, we are not at planned uh, to have a polarimeter, but uh, yeah, in future, uh, in the next step, we can uh, take it up. OK. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, if there is any other question, please um, log into our Slack channel and post your questions there. And I think spe our speakers will be able to respond to that. Uh, so now uh, 
for the next speaker, I just hand over it over to Shantar. Shantar, over to you. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, our next speaker is uh, from Gregor. Uh, it's a 1.5 meter Gregor solar telescope. Thomas, would you want to share your slide? Yes, just a second. I would give you a warning around 22 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you can see the slide. Hello, so my name is Thomas Berkefeld from the uh, Leibniz Institute for Solar Physics in Germany. And I'm going to talk about the 1.5 meter Gregor Solar Telescope. So first I'll explain some key features and the main optics and the aspects of the adaptive optics. Um, then uh, present, science, present science instruments plus results. And finally the future science instruments in the near future. So Gregor is located on Tenerife on the Canary Islands and it has been in scientific operation since 2012 and is run and paid by the Leibniz Institute for Solar Physics, uh, the Astrophysikalisches Institut Potsdam and the Max Planck Institute für Sonnensystemforschung Göttingen, uh, all Germany. And then there's the IAC on the Canary Islands uh, who made uh, strong instrument con contributions for us. So Gregor is a on-axis, a double Gregory type on-axis telescope, 1.5 meter in diameter. Uh, double Gregory means that the primary mirror, primary mirror um, has a parabolic shape, the secondary mirror has an elliptical shape, and the tertiary mirror has also an, an elliptical shape. The central obstruction is 30%. The usable field of view is two arc minutes. We have a field stop here in the primary focus and the unused sunlight is reflected sideways. The operational wavelength regime is from 380 to uh, nanometers to 2.3 micron. Um, and what is very important, we have a calibration unit in the secondary focus at, the, at F2. That's still in, in the symmetric part of the beam and that enhances the um, polarometric um, sensitivity considerably. You have an image derotator that can be removed, which is especially important if you lack light. We have an adaptive optics system um, downstream, not shown here, and we have stationary science, instrument, um, science instruments uh, after the tertiary focus F3. Some of the mirrors are used for, for beam steering, uh, namely the, the hexapod, uh, the, the M2 uh, used for focusing. Um, the M5 mirror is, um, which is here, is used for beam steering at the, at the F3 image focus and the M11 mirror is used for pupil steering. And those are all controlled by the adaptive optics system. Um, here's a bottom, uh, here's a top view of the AO relay optics, which has been completely redesigned um, in 2019 and has been installed in 2020. So it's all, it's a purely horizontal layout now. Um, and we have the, the beam is coming from the top and um, falls on M11. And then you have the typical AO relay setup with, with the um, uh, collimator here tip tilt mirror here, the M here, re-imager here, and then, uh, which is different, um, we have the, we have a beam splitter here, um, which separates, um, which is the first beam splitter, which separates the visual, the, um, the visual from the infrared. So the infrared passes on and the visual wavelengths uh, get reflected. That has the advantage that all following anti-reflection coatings can be optimized either to the infrared or the visual, which means that we have much less stray light than before. And we have, since the beam splitter plate is um, mounted on the rotary stage, we can choose from different cutoff wavelengths. Right now uh, we have 650 and 900 nanometers installed. And then we have the adaptive optics wavefront sensor situated here. Um, 
And we have various um, signs for psi, F4 here for the visual, and, and this is the, the F4 for the infrared, is also the entrance slit of the spectrograph, of the infrared spectrograph. So again, the advantage uh, of the new setup is less stray light. Um, we have a perfect MTF at the science foci across the full two arc minute field of view. Um, the setup is more stable because it's all horizontal and we have less, less misalignments, um, also due to some organizational um, changes. So people are not, uh, there are, we have strict um, orders not to touch the optics and that helps. And what we found out also is that it's much easier to align um, because all, all is horizontal. Um, so the degrees of freedom of vertical and horizontal are not mixed any longer. We have a new control uh, GUI for the telescope that replaces about 10 separate GUIs. Um, uh, it's much easier to use now. A few parts are still missing, but only a few, and it's, it's really fun to use now. Then we have an integrated um, adaptive optics system that feeds all instruments. So the, we get to the diffraction limit um, for seeing better than one arc second at 500 nanometers. Um, that's for sunspot and pores. For granulation, uh, a little bit, um, the seeing has to be a little bit better. But it also depends, of course, on the CN square profile and the wind speed. Um, if you observe at high zenith angles, <coughs> Um, you won't be able to reach the diffraction limit. Stable, uh, the, the closed loop is operating stable in a stable manner for, for seeing um, up to three arc seconds for both and sunspots and about 1.6 to two arc seconds on granulation. Uh, the control loop frequency is 2.1 kilohertz and we get a zero to be bandwidth of 110 hertz. You can correct about 150 modes, um, and the sub size is uh, 9 centimeters. And as I mentioned, we have additional control loops for pupil steering, which is extremely important, uh, and for tilt and focus offloading uh, to the telescope. Yeah, it's easy to use. Uh, whenever possible, we use off-the-shelf components uh, that, concern, that concerns especially the cameras that we switch regularly if better cameras are available. Uh, the DM is made by Silas, um, stack Pearson mirror with 256 actuators, and the tilt mirror is made by Physik Instrumental. Yeah, this is an, an image of, of the GUI. Um, on, on, the, on the lower right, you see some, some settings and, and buttons for, for um, switching between, between the various states. Um, some status information in, in the middle and on the right, on the upper right, you see uh, the image of the wavefront sensor and the resulting correlation functions um, that we get by cross-correlating with the reference. And, and if the seeing is good, uh, they are, can be very point-like. Um, and that is how it's supposed to be. Um, and on the bottom right, you can see uh, an image of the tip tilt mirror and uh, the DM and the colors uh, reflect the uh, uh, stroke of the actuators. And again, it's, it's pretty easy to use. Then we have a nighttime AO system for the solar, uh, for the Gregor planet polarometer. The same, the same DM, same software, but a different wavefront sensor. Um, it must handle varying object diameters and brightnesses object brightnesses. Um, so we must have different sub, uh, different sub aperture geometry and field stop sizes and also control loop frequency um, frequencies, um, everything adapted to the object. Uh, mostly use uh, mostly use is a setup uh, of 20 centimeter, 24 centimeter sub aperture size, sub aperture size, which also corresponds to a 20 to a 24 corrected modes, 25 corrected modes, and also 24 sub apertures. And the field of view in this case is 10 arc seconds, and the control loop typically is 500 hertz. Uh, and we use an uh, EMCCD camera for that. And and uh, on the right, on the lower right, you see uh, an image of the wavefront sensor locking uh, on the arc of Venus. Um, and on the right again, the, the resulting uh, correlation functions, and that work pretty reliably. Now, coming to the science instruments and results. Um, 
First, we have the near infrared spectral polarimeter GRIS, which is sort of the bread and butter system. Um, for Gregor, that is the instrument with which most um, papers are produced. Um, the wavelength range um, is uh, from one to 2.3 micron uh, with, with uh, three, three separate ranges, out of which two um, ranges can be used for, for polarimetry. And mostly used are the 10830 line and the, the iron 1.56 uh, micron line. The spatial resolution is 2 point, uh, 0.25, so that is diffraction, limit, diffraction limited at the 1.5 micron line, and the spectral resolution is about 100,000. Um, the polarimet polarimetric sensitivity can go down to 10 to the, to the minus 4. Um, and it can be used with the um, with the ZIMPOOL, the Zurich Imaging Polarimeter. And since 2019, there's an integrated field unit with a field of view of 3.3 times 6 um, arc seconds. So that so there you can a simultaneous uh, spectrum uh, across this this field of view. Uh, uh, the size is limited by by the detector. Uh, sampling is not quite diffraction limited, uh, but close to the to the diffraction limit at least for the uh, for the one point five uh, micron line. Uh, so that's a trade off between field of view and spatial resolution. Yeah, that's uh, that's a uh, uh, view. Um, at the here's the entrance. Uh, here's the entrance somewhere. Here's the entrance with a polarimeter. And the light goes down, um, hitting that that mirror, that folding mirror. Then you have the typical setup of of um, uh, um, of that the uh, God. Yes, now I forgot that name. <laughs> the collimator, the the grating, the camera mirror. Uh, and a folding mirror, and uh, finally the, the the science camera, yeah, right collimator. That was it. Uh, so here are, are some gross maps. Uh, that is what you could typically get a full Stokes uh, um, for a scan. The uh, uh, slit has mostly been um, speckled or, or um, post processed away, and um, we are quite happy with that instrument. So here are some spectral profiles at 1.5 uh, micron. That is what you what you typically get. Then we have the slit shower camera system that has been redesigned in 2018. Um, field of view is 90 arc seconds, diffraction limited, spatial resolution. We have three channels, um, with one being an uh, H alpha channel. Uh, with a Leo, with an H alpha Leo filter, um, 0.5 angstrom um, uh, full sub maximum. Then we have um, on con continuous channel, which is currently has a 988 nanometer wavelength, and we have a free channel that can be filled with a future with a future camera. Then we have the then we have a couple of images. Um, uh, they have a field of view up to 60 arc seconds and are diffra diffraction limited. Um, up to four simultaneous uh, channels um, can be used, um, and we have a, so I think about 50 interference filters um, covering the most uh, important solar wavelength. Um, and and again, also for the for one of the images, we have a for the HIFA imager, we have an H alpha Leo filter. Um, then we have H alpha broadband, titanium oxide, G band, uh, C2, uh, calcium 2, and so on and so on. That is also um, widely used. Here's an example of, of, a, of a short G band movie. Um, unfortunately, the scene got, got worse pretty quickly. But you can see that the if you look at the details here, um, the detail is, is is quite good, and this is um, very close to the diffraction limit and or at the diffraction limit. Um, this is an 
uh, a zoom in um, of a large of a 60 by of a 50 by 40 arc second field of view um, image at the 524 nanometer wavelengths. And this is um, as good um, as you can get. There you see everything and the image quality uh, is like this over the whole field of view. So we are happy, very happy with that. Um, seeing was about um, 15 to 20 centimeters. Um, and, but nevertheless, um, this shows that the, that the optical quality of the telescope is, is, is good. You, you get the high, the high spatial frequencies get through and down to the, to the science focus across the whole field of view. And this sort of this sort of, of uh, detail um, was not possible before the before the change of the optics. Then we have the Gregor Planet Polarometer um, that measures the full Stokes vector of solar system planets. And the, 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 the larger plan is to use this information as specimen for extrasolar planets, which then can be observed with the, the large nighttime telescopes. Uh, it's a dual beam polarometer, 40 arc seconds speed of view, which is just about enough for, for Jupiter. Um, a large wavelength range, uh, spatial resolution is 0.16 arc seconds, so that is not diffraction limited. But that is due to the to the um, cameras. It's again a uh, uh, balance between spatial resolution and field of view. And uh, two fast uh, FLCs retarders are used, and two zero order retarders. Um, and uh, the fast modulation is done uh, to avoid seeing defects. Yeah, and this is uh, an image um, of the setup as it has been in the. As it has been, oops, um, as it has been in 2015, and we are going to reinstall that pretty soon. This is the result of uh, 2015, and you see uh, you see the clear um, signal of the, the clear polarimetric signals, um, but you have to integrate quite a long time. And what we found is a two to three percent polarization at the limb. What we also saw when using a uh, methane band filter on Uranus, you could see the, the very thin uh, methane bands on this on, on the Uranus surface. So that was basically at the at the resolution limit, spatial resolution limit um, of the polarimeter. And yeah, we were happy um, to see that. Uh, what we were surprised was that the seeing, the nighttime seeing um, at Tenerife is um, relatively often quite good. So we regularly got about 30 centimeters at, at 500 nanometers. Uh, we were surprised to see that. Finally, future instruments. Um, very important is the GRIS upgrade um, in 21. At the end of 21, so we want to have um, simultaneous uh, observations for um, 10830, calcium 85, 50, uh, 42, uh, and the H alpha wavelength to sample the chromosphere better. Um, so we will have three cameras for that. Uh, therefore, we um, we get a new grating. Uh, the Detectors will, of course, be synchronized, and also the, the polarimeter um, will be new. And that is built again by the IAC. This is built by the IAC, by the way. Then, also very important is LEAP. Um, that's a planned imaging spectral polarimeter um, for the wavelength range between 520 and 860. Uh, should be diffraction limited, field of view will be 60 arc seconds, and it will be similar to CRISP at the Swedish um, solar telescope. Telescope um, spectral resolution will be close to 100,000. It will be a dual beam polarimeter, and it will be combined with broadband channel and um, additional imaging channels and fa phase diversity channel. The design already exists, but has been made by, by Lucia Klein, now at the University of Geneva. And LEAP will be a collaboration um, between the University of Geneva, Ursul, and, and Ursul, uh, both in Switzerland, and the University of Stockholm, and KISS, um, and details are to be negotiated. 
Um, that's an optical design. Um, it's an, the, the, the general setup, it's a telecentric um, setup um, similar, to, similar to, to Chris. Eta etalons are quite large, but that's due to the large telescope size, um, but it's quite compact actually. And the image quality at the science focus at the science camera and the narrowband channel is, is basically perfect. And we hope to get that as soon as possible. Then in addition to, in addition to the AO, um, that will, we will have a solar H-alpha prominence off-limb AO so that we can lock off-limb on solar prominences. Um, there has been recent, recent uh, camera, um, well, development um, so that we think we can get uh, close to the solar IO, solar IO performance wise, um, of course, with a different wavefront sensor, but we will have a motorized um, stage for quick exchange with the uh, normal solar IO. Then that is not an instrument, but that's uh, very important also. That's a fast 10 gigabyte sec per second data link to Germany, which will probably happen in, in June or July. Um, that means that we then can uh, transfer the data daily to Germany and need less computing facilities and storage um, on Tenerife. And, and that will also include, um, that will also lead to better remote observing capabilities. So we, and due, due to COVID, we were forced to do remote observations um, basically for, from, for, for the second half of the year, last year and for, for this year. Actually, and that went very well, um, but of course we had a problem with data transfer, so that we have, we have to increase the bandwidth, and also the the GUIs, the the graphical user interface, and the image, the display of, of cameras and so on, is better if if the if the data rate is higher. So that will be uh, also a very important um, upgrade uh, for the telescope. And without uh, an exact uh, time timeline, uh, we will have an MCAO uh, with four additional uh, DMs. And uh, that will be a precursor of the EST. Um, corrected field of view will be, well, the current plan is 60 arc seconds, maybe it's 40 to 50, we will see. But the timeline needs to be needs to be uh, defined and it's, we, have, we, have to, we have to hire people to do that. And then um, we would also like to build um, a visible spectrograph, um, specs TBD, and also a blue imaging um, solar spectropolarimeter, um, specs TBD, that would basically be similar to, to Chromus um, on, the, on the SST. And that it, that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for an interesting talk. Uh, there were a few chat questions. Uh, let me ask uh, Frederick. You can unmute yourselves and ask your question. Sure. Hi, uh, Thomas. Good to see you. Um, ah, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was wondering, have you ever pointed the uh, nighttime AO uh, that you were talking about to uh, the solar limb structures? Yes, we did. And this is why that's why we have a rough estimate of the of the amount of, of photons we get, and also that we that we need a, need a relatively large field of view. So so we will have about twenty arc seconds field of view for the wavefront sensor. Um, yes, we did that, and yeah. Awesome. All right. Did you use a narrowband H alpha filter for that, or did you? Just um, we we use we use. Um, I think we used a uh, three angstrom interference filter, which of course is too broad, um, mm -hmm. but that's the only one we had quickly available. Okay, cool, thank you. Venkat, uh, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I have two questions. One is, uh, I was, I was uh, curious to know about the uh, off-limb uh, adaptive optics. So do you have any Laser guidance or something like that. Maybe. No, um, we, we use we use a, a narrow band um, H alpha filter. Uh, probably about one um, a dual cavity, one angstrom or one point, well maybe one point two angstrom uh, dual cavity filter. That will give us enough photons um, um, and a sensitive camera with low noise, of course. 
and and it has to be fast, of course, but not an but not an EMCCD camera. And uh, one more, uh, I was uh, you were mentioning sixty centimeter and thirty centimeter for the C. Uh, probably you meant millimeters for this R zero. Oh um, no, no, for for the that was for the night. Um, at night time, we often get relatively good seeing. As a, so we have regularly uh, seeing uh, above twenty five centimeters. Oh, okay. Uh, up, up, up to 40, up to forty centimeters. Oh, okay. At at fifty two fifty two high twenty nanometer. Uh, that, that was um, at five hundred nanometer for five hundred nanometers. Okay. That's fantastic. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Nagaraju. Ah, uh, hi. Yes. Uh, hello, Thomas. Hello. Uh, I just want to know what's the frame rate of uh, EMCCD, and what is the size of the sensor? Um, the size of the sensor is um, the size of the sensor is one twenty eight by one twenty eight. Okay. Um, which which is actually the reason why we want to change we will change the camera. Uh, to an, an under Zyla camera, water could under Zyla camera, um, uh, which, uh, which for which we can then use a larger field of view. Um, and another advantage is for um, extended objects, um, you pay the penalty for, for doubling the photon noise um, uh, for, in, in, for EMCCD cameras, which you don't um, for, for normal cameras. And we uh, only want, and we only only want to use the, the uh, what is that called the, the one of one of the amplifier stages, the, the high gain stage, basically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Ravinder, you had a question on MCAO. Uh, yeah, I think that is answered. Uh, but the related question was uh, uh, when you are using the telescope for uh, solar system uh, objects at night time. Yes. Uh, you said you are locking it to the limb of the planets or moons of the planet. And, uh, um, just... Well, but what? No, we. we um, so we, when we lock on, so I've given the example for Venus. Um, Venus. That okay. is somewhere here. So um, Uranus fits in completely in the field of view. That is not a problem. Um, Nep Neptune also works but that is really close to the detection limit because Gregor is not use is not optimized for high uh, light throughput that works but uh, and but yeah it's it, at, the, at the limit so um, then then yes there's um, Saturn um, so Saturn there we lock um, at the intersection of the ring with with the with the um, with the um, with the planet itself, and there there's some some dark features, some some dark um, black background basically, and, and some bright features, and there you can lock on. And then there's for Jupiter, then we lock on a on a on an area close to to the to the equator, where you have the horizontal cloud bands, and the and the and the limb that that also defines both axes. That works. We've checked that, and then there's Mars. And Mars, we, we also did that, but that was boring. Um, and all the, the seeing was bad, so mm -hmm. we don't have good results on that. So, but do you think uh, if you use laser guide star like sodium laser or things of yes. that sort, would it improve the nighttime performance? Uh, probably, um, probably, um, but laser guide stars are so, so complicated. You, you have. Uh, given given the the uh, the whole metrology you you, you need, and that, that is several millions, and that is way beyond our scope. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we are a solar a solar institute, uh, and and not nighttime. So we we just so what we do if we want to do with nighttime is we just build the wavefront sensor because that is simple. But uh, adding an, a laser guide star definitely would improve things, but but um, the, the 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 effort would be way our beyond our reach. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, maybe one last question from Sridharan. Hi, uh, this is regarding AMO. You mentioned about nighttime seeing about 30 centimeters. What is the typical seeing in the daytime you get and how often you are able to operate AMO without any interruption, say for an hour or two hours continuously? And what's the kind of seeing required for that? Um, so, <clears throat> uh, 
as I mentioned, the the you need at least three. Yeah, you need at least three arc seconds uh, on pause or sunspot and 1.6 or two, two arc seconds on granulation. Um, so that corresponds to three centimeters on pause and sunspot and about, uh, let's say, six centimeters on granulation. And well, we, we have a problem with Gregor, and that is that the building is not high enough. So the seeing um, gets worse pretty quickly. So typically, when we can observe up to two hours, one and a half to two hours, and then and then we, we still, and, and then we can still lock uh, with the AO still works, but but the, the the science data is not good enough to be usable. Then that is that is lim the limit actually. Okay. Okay. With, with the with the if how height I me mean, if you had gone. Do you mean if you had gone a little bit higher in the telescope height, had been a little bit higher, it could have been useful? I, I, I can. I, this is very important. The, the a solar telescope, the building of a solar telescope should be as high as possible. So our the, the Gregor telescope, the building of the Gregor telescope um, is 10 meters or so lower than than, than the the neighboring VTT, and the the seeing at the VTT um, stays better much longer. And so for if you for 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 instance, for the NLST, build build the, the, the building as high as possible, as high as you can afford. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thomas, for a wonderful talk. Uh, let you. me now uh, uh, Ravinder Banyan to carry over the next talk. Okay, Shankar. So the last speaker for uh, this session is Professor Frederick Vogel from National Solar Observatory USA, and Frederick is going to talk about the biggest instrumentation in adoptive optics. Um, so uh, good morning, Frederick. You can start now. Please. Hi, thank you. Um, although I'm not a technically a professor in general, <laughs> just want to correct that. Um, okay. Um, yes, as, uh, as uh, Ravinda said, I'm going to talk about DKIST and um, DKIST instrumentation in particular. Um, let's see if I can, there you go. Uh, this is of course uh, um, a big effort and I'm just here to talk about it as the instrument system scientist of DKIST. Uh, Thomas Rimmel is our director and uh, he's done a great job in making this project happen. And of course, I'm only presenting results uh, that uh, have come to pass because of a great team that we have, um, uh, some of which are online here. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'll go a little bit into detail on the telescope itself. Um, so it's a, a four meter aperture telescope with an F2 beam into the prime focus. Um, contrary to, uh, to uh, uh, the other telescopes that were presented here, it's an off axis design um, that allows us to have no spider, um, no central obscuration. Uh, it's uh, on an alt as mound with a, all reflecting optics uh, down into the coup de platform. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, it's kind of the beams coming down here, um, being reflected here at the top end optical assembly, where also the heat stops located. And then the beam is diverted down um, into a box right here. And I'll show you that box in a second. That's where our targets and our calibration optics uh, for polarimetry are. And then the beam is diverted uh, uh, along the um, axis down, the, the rotation axis down into the coup de level. And right here is where all our instruments are. And I'm gonna talk about that obviously in a little bit more detail. Our heat stop um, transmits up to five arc minutes of field of view. Um, and uh, uh, the telescope itself is designed from the start as a uh, to have low scattered light. It's a it is a coronagraph. Um, we have a lure stop and a limo culture with that can be ac actively controlled um, in order to keep uh, good coronal capabilities. There's a in situ clean and wash of M1 possible. Um, 
we have an integrated adaptive optic system, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I think it's important to say that the telescope um, was designed and built as a high precision polarimeter um, in order to control seeing um, in the dome and in the coude, um, everything is thermally controlled. Um, I think uh, the DKIST is uh, deviating a, a little bit from uh, current telescope operations. Um, and we are trying to, uh, or, or concepts, and, and we're trying to operate the telescope um, in service mode, uh, meaning that typically the PI is not present at the site. Uh, rather, uh, highly trained operators and, and scientists are present to acquire the data, which will be um, transferred and available over uh, 10 gig E line um, in Boulder. Um, here are a few pictures. Um, I like this one because it shows everything that the facility has to offer, really. Um, you have, uh, of course, the main structure right here, but um, you also have uh, this facility um, that's separate uh, on purpose from the main telescope itself. This is where all our thermal control um, uh, converters are. There's a, here are ice tanks that we're making at, we're making ice at night and cooling to cool water during the day so that our mirrors um, and the facility can be thermally controlled. The um, air conditioners are all in this building, in this brown building. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the first time that M1 was coated. In the meantime, we have recoated it uh, last year in the fall um, to prepare for science operations. Um, but it gives you a scale of how thin the mirror actually is in order to be able to actively control it. This is uh, a picture um, of the telescope structure and the mirror mirror is right here, the primary mirror. The beam is actually reflected to the heat stop. And what you can see here is, is how the heat stop um, is reflective. And this is actually not the opening of our um, dome, but it is uh, the reflection of the beam of, of, uh, of, of the heat stop. And the beam goes again, uh, comes from the primary, goes into the top end heat stop, uh, top end optical assembly, hits M2, and the beam is then deflected right here. You can maybe see um, the five arc minute field of view right there. Um, this is where the secondary focus is. And you, we have multiple um, uh, uh, calibration optics in, uh, uh, in the secondary focus for, as I mentioned earlier, for um, calibration, in, uh, both in terms of image scale, as well as polarimetry. Uh, polarimetry. Um, now I'm uh, switching gears and going a little bit into the instrumentation itself, which, as I mentioned earlier, is located um, on the CUDE platform, which rotates in order to compensate for, um, for the image rotation of the Gregorian design. Um, the beam comes down, um, hits M7, um, and then um, gets deflected to M8, M9. Um, and then <clears throat> we have uh, a um, suite of mirrors and, um, and dichroic beam splitters that can divert our light into um, different instrumentation simultaneously. Um, just wanted to give you uh, overview over these instruments. Uh, we have uh, five first light images, uh, first light instruments um, that are all of uh, image um, slit and IFU based. Um, the focus uh, was always on spectroporometry. Actually, all of the instruments, oops, all of the instruments are um, dual beam polarimeters with the exception of the visible broadband image, which is a pure imaging instrument. Um, we have um, uh, the VISP, the visible uh, spectral polarimeter, 
uh, DL NERSP, uh, diffraction limited near infrared spectropolarimeter, cryo NERSP, uh, cryogenic uh, near infrared spectropolarimeter, and the visible tunable filter, and of course the visible broadband imager, which was the first instrument that we uh, took on Sun. Um, the wavefront correction uh, system is located right here. Um, and uh, we are, uh, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, before I do that, um, I wanted to point out our facility instrument distribution optics, um, similar to some of the um, uh, telescopes that were presented here before. Um, we split our light into um, bands um, using a pretty a uh, complex um, suite of uh, dichroic beam splitters that can be rearranged as the science case needs within typically a couple hours. Um, so uh, he, the beam comes in here on the right. The cryo is separate from the other instruments in that it does not benefit typically from wavefront correction. So we can uh, put a mirror in, in, in the beam to deflect the beam to the cryonersp. If that mirror is out of the beam, um, we first hit the wavefront correction beam, beam splitter one, uh, which is uh, diverting 4% of the light into our um, AO system. And then um, we have different um, uh, locations for different beam splitters that compensate each other's, um, uh, each other's dispersion um, uh, and, uh, and reflect uh, at first um, blue light typically into the um, instruments that benefit from uh, the, the shorter wavelengths and, um, and progressively go through a, this suite of beam splitters until we go to the DL NERSP, uh, which is uh, the one that has, um, uh, or is, uh, you typically uses the um, uh, infrared wavelengths. Uh, to give you, give you an, uh, an idea, we can, this, this, uh, um, this suite here, shows how you can um, uh, how you can feed all instruments with some of the light um, at the same time. So all all instruments can operate um, with the exception of the cryonurse begin, all of the instruments can operate simultaneously within different wavelength bands. And you can see on the picture to the right, you can see here is the waveform correction beam splitter. This is the beam splitter at CL2, CL3, CL4. And then this mirror over here diverts the beam into the DL NERSP. Um, and this is uh, the beam splitter CL2A right here. You can see already that, that the light's already a little bit redder reflected. Uh, that's the uh, a true dichroic here at this point. Um, another view is uh, uh, through uh, of the other side of the DL NERSP um, mirror. We have uh, here CL4, CL3, CL2, the waveform correction beam splitter, and the DM in the background. So this is a fairly complex system. Um, and again, all these beam splitters can be rearranged in order to feed certain instruments, certain um, bands of light as they, as the science use case requires. Current status of these beam splitters is that um, we have uh, most of our um, mirrors and windows and, and three of the dichroics. Two of, two of the dichroics are still um, being manufactured and we expect them um, sometimes in the spring of this year. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the waveform correction system. Um, the first slide, DKIST AO, um, is a single conjugate system designed to achieve about 30% strail at 
seven centimeters. And what I didn't write here, uh, 60% straight uh, are, are not being greater than 12 centimeters. Um, in order to achieve that, um, we are um, uh, we're employing 1,600 actuators um, uh, and uh, typical uh, separate uh, fast tip tilt. Um, they are driven by the correlating shake heart and wavefront sensor, which is uh, typically using 1457 active sub apertures in order to compute the correlation functions and measure the wavefront. Um, the system, because of the computational needs of such a uh, uh, endeavor, um, is a low, uh, employs a low latency hybrid uh, FPGA and CPU real time controller. All these computers are actually mounted underneath the CUDA platform, uh, so you don't see them in any of these images because they're all on top of um, the CUDA platform where we can see um, the optics. Um, here you can see uh, in this image, you can see the three arms um, that, the, that the wavefront correction system uses. This is a context imager. Um, uh, that goes straight through. It also uh, is used as the reference for the bore side of the telescope. Um, on the right-hand side, you have the high-order wavefront sensor, and on the left-hand side, you have the low-order wavefront sensor. The high-order wavefront sensor uses um, is used in diffraction-limited um, <clears throat> scenarios. The low-order wavefront sensor is used to drive the active optics when um, the seeing is not good enough to go high order. Um, and that's uh, something I wanted to point out. Similar to Gregor, um, we um, have active optics control um, using M1 and M2 in order to reduce any wavefront errors that are quasi-static. Um, and, um, and we are using um, the, the wavefront correction system also to control bore site and pupil of the telescope um, simultaneously. Um, here's a different view, which has the DM and its controls um, on the background. And, uh, and again, going through is the uh, context imager on the right-hand side, lower the wavefront sensor, on the left-hand side, higher the wavefront sensor. Um, this is actually a movie, but these are the types of images that um, we have been getting with the um, with the uh, context imager. This is a, a sunspot that we acquired earlier, early 2020, um, before COVID hit. Um, uh, these are um, processed images, but you can um, you can see that uh, there's a lot of detail there uh, at the diffraction limit, actually, of the four meter aperture. Um, now, I'll talk a little bit about the visible broadband imager. Um, this is a pure in-house uh, instrument. Um, this is the only instrument. Again, it's not a spectropolarimeter. So I guess uh, we went the easy route on this one, but uh, uh, it's still a complicated instrument. Um, it's um, employing diffraction limited sampling over a two arc minute um, field of view. Um, we have two channels uh, in this system. Um, the blue channel um, has a, on a filter wheel uh, calcium K, G band, blue continuum, and H beta. Um, and in the in the red um, in the red uh, channel, we have an H alpha filter, uh, red continuum, titanium oxide, and ion eleven. Um, the chromospheric uh, wavelengths are with very small uh, bandwidths um, of the order of half an angstrom. Uh, these channels uh, op uh, are operated independently, but they can be synchronized to each other. Um, and uh, we plan to uh, we plan to do near real time spectral image reconstruction on the summit in each channel. 
So as such, the VBI really stresses the high cadence and high spatial resolution um, of DKIST and uh, will deliver um, diffraction emitted uh, data of, of the telescope. Here is some examples. This is the 789 line. This was uh, um, late in 2019 when we first pointed the telescope to the sun, actually. So these are some of the first images of DKIST um, with AO and the VBI. Right now, um, we are finishing um, acceptance testing of the VBI. And uh, um, again, I think it was pretty successful uh, in the sense that uh, we turned on the telescope and were able to acquire diffraction limited data, which is, uh, which is very um, an ambitious uh, thing to do. I'm, I'm going to show a few uh, movies uh, of the VBI um, of uh, data of the same um, campaign. Now the first in, uh, light initiative of, of on the left hand side you see 705, which is the titanium oxide line. And on the right, you can see um, wing edge alpha. Uh, you actually do see a um, uh, chromospheric structure, but because it's off band, obviously the, the photosphere shines through. Um, but it, it just shows you um, the quality of the data. And um, in order to see that in a little bit more detail, let's go to this movie, um, it's, uh, this is the center of that field of view. And um, you can see uh, um, pretty much diffraction limited uh, structure at that level. Um, I think earlier in the session, we saw some of the um, simulations. And um, Given that this is the 705 line, um, this is at the diffraction limit of DKIST. Um, so let's uh, switch gears to the visible spectral polarimeter. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, it actually stresses high spectral fidelity and flexibility. Um, and will deliver um, high precision spectral polarimetry. Um, this is an instrument built uh, by our partners at the High Altitude Observatory uh, with uh, Roberto Cassini as the principal investigator and Alfred Devine as the instrument scientist. Um, it uh, features three uh, separate spectral bands um, simultaneous um, um, and uh, within a spectral range of 380 to 900 nanometers. Um, these uh, three channels are operated simultaneously, and um, and you can see here the three cameras as they have been integrated at the summit. This is a fairly recent picture. Um, they uh, the the three arms are are on a um, on a on a um, rail and can be. Um, can be positioned anywhere within um, within the uh, uh, within any order, basically, on of the spectrograph. Um, the possibilities are almost infinite in the sense of uh, um, being able to observe uh, three desired um, wavelength ranges. Uh, simultaneously. Um, it, it has uh, five, uh, five slits um, of different size. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, this, uh, as all the other instruments uh, except the BBI, is a dual beam um, spectral polarimeter, standard grading based in, 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 in the VISP. Um, VISP uh, has been installed, um, a little bit on the status here. It's been installed and aligned on the CUDE floor. Um, we are currently finishing um, site acceptance testing. Um, the team was out there in uh, uh, 
end of January, uh, beginning of February, and uh, has brought back some some spectra of the sun um, for um, site acceptance testing. Those are not quite science grade yet, but uh, um, we will uh, go to uh, or we're we're planning to uh, have science verification in uh, in the summer at this point. But you can see here. The optical performance is already pretty good in all three arms. These are target images as they were scanned um, in all three arms. And you can see also that um, because of the uh, anamorphic magnification, the uh, each arm has a slightly different image scale yeah. and field of view. Sorry to intervene, uh, Frederick. You have another yeah. three minutes. OK. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try to speed up here. Um, uh, the diffraction limited uh, near infrared spectrocolorimeter is another instrument that, that's being built, in this case, by the University of Hawaii um, with a principal investigator, Hao Sheng Lin, and uh, Sarah Yek, the SD instrument scientist. It's, um, it's a, um, a diffraction grading based integral field um, unit spectrograph. Um, fed by fibers. Um, the field of view uh, can be switched between low, mid, and high resolution. Low is typically used for coronal observations. Um, mid and high res is for on-disk observations. The fields of view are um, two and a half by five arc seconds in the, in the, in the high res mode to five to um, five arc seconds and uh, in the mid range and then I think one arc second uh, uh, oh, uh, um, uh, I can't remember right what the number was but the uh, substantially bigger for the uh, low res mode um, it's also uh, has three arms that can be operated simultaneously um, in different wavelength bands in this case. Um, each wavelength is fixed, unfortunately, um, and not featuring the high flexibility that the VISP has, but at the same time, you get a field of view and, um, and uh, 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 spectra at the same time two-dimensional field of view, of course. And in the spirit of finishing up here, um, the instruments being integrated um, right now um, has gone through its lab acceptance and being integrated right now. You can see the three arms here in this image um, and site acceptance and science verification is again planned for summer of this year. On to the cryogenic uh, neon infrared spectropolarimeter. Um, this is an instrument that was built for the infrared wavelengths between one and five microns. Um, it, uh, it, it is a, it's a, um, technically a um, conventional grading-based spectrograph uh, inside a Dewar. Um, and um, it, it has two slit widths, one for on-disk and one for um, coronal observations. Actually, the cryo nurse right now is the only instrument that um, is, um, is making use of our five arc minute field of view. All post-AO um, uh, instruments actually only use 2.8 arc minutes round. Um, so the instrument uh, is, is also built by the University of Hawaii with uh, Jeff Kuhn as the principal investigator and Andre Fehlmann as the instrument scientist. And uh, um, they are um, working right now up at the summit, actually integrating the system. And um, it has started acceptance testing already. Um, some science verification is going to be in the summer of this year. And last but not least, uh, the visible tunable filter is built by our colleagues at the Leibniz Institute for Sonnenphysik uh, in Freiburg. Um, principal investigators Oskar von der Lue and the instrument scientist is Matthias Schubert. This is a very complicated um, uh, uh, Faber Pro based interferometer uh, or spectropolarimeter, basically. Um, 
Uh, it, it has two narrowband channels um, for the dual beam uh, spectropolarimetry um, and one broadband channel that's uh, operated simultaneously for reference. Um, you, uh, you, you can uh, uh, basically um, go through four wavelengths at this point, uh, the sodium D, ion, uh, ion 1, uh, H-alpha, and the calcium infrared ions. Um, again, uh, it's a dual beam spectropolarimeter, and um, uh, we retain the field of view by um, having two cameras. Uh, it's under, undergoing construction right now. Um, the instrument will be commissioned first in a single etalon, a uh, single etalon configuration. Um, the second etalon is already in fabrication right now and will be delivered after the instrument has been commissioned as DKIST, which is planned for um, spring and summer next year. And that brings me to the summary. Uh, we're quickly approaching the end of construction, which we planned for end of uh, this year. Um, definitely COVID-19 has had an impact um, on us for finishing. Um, the, but the telescope is already performing very well. Uh, First Light Initiative has shown us uh, the many opportunities here. Um, Instrumentation is being integrated into the system as we speak right now, and uh, the plan is to have all major instrument systems operating nominally by the end of 2021. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Frederick. I think that was a wonderful talk, and I'm sure many people are looking forward to exciting results that are coming going to come from uh, come out of. So we have time for maybe a couple of uh, questions. So please uh, um, raise your hand, uh, just unmute yourself and ask uh, questions. Uh, Frederick, this is Sankar. Can I ask Hi. you? Uh, so this is regarding, uh, I mean, if I remember correctly, uh, DKIST is supposed to do this uh, queue mode observation. That is, you send in a proposal and wait in the queue as and when it happens, the proposal is observed. That is still uh, uh, still available for DKIST? Um, so we call that service mode. And yes, so we have had a first... Uh, we have had a first call for proposals and they have been reviewed and um, and already for those um, uh, proposals, uh, uh, we are planning to have this service mode um, uh, observations where typically the PI is not on summit. Um, that said, I think if I recall correctly, um, there are opportunities that have to be justified where the PI can come to the telescope site as well. Okay. Did, did I answer your question there? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm please. Jim. Yeah, I'm Jim. Please. Jim. yeah Jim, hey. please go ahead. Yes. Uh, you have sh shown some windows in the uh, optical layout. What is the purpose of those windows? Okay, uh, let's see here. Let me go to that page. Um, yeah. This one? Uh, uh, window CL1, CL4. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, so uh, to, to separate that out, um, these are CUDE locations, so they are located the uh, CL um, mark um, locations on um, in the, in the optical train of DKIST, um, and because these um, optics, as you can see, are big and uh, thick, um, if you do not have a dichroic beam splitter in each of these locations, 
you would shift um, the focal position inside each instrument. And so if, um, if you were to simply remove the optic, um, you would shift, for example, if you took them out of CL2 and CL3, you would shift the focal position and the DL nurse considerably, basically um, beyond the capability of the DL nurse instrument to compensate for that focal shift. So we have to have windows in replacing these that transfer all the light to the DL nurse. That's the purpose of these um, of these uh, um, windows. Thank and, you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's a question from Oscar Steiner. Uh, so Oscar, please uh, unmute yourself and okay. provide an us. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, Frederick. Uh, hi. I uh, weren't there problems with the heat stop cooling, and uh, have they been solved uh, by now? Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, I guess um, uh, so. The first, so we had a design heat stop that was absorptive, um, and that uh, um, heat stop failed early on um, and uh, was replaced in a very uh, uh, big effort very quickly. So we had two months' time before we went on the sun for the first time to replace that. Um, heat stop, and we made it reflective instead of absorptive. Um, and uh, at that point, um, those uh, you know, cooling issues were solved. But um, the downside of that was that we were not able to put uh, to 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 point the telescope anywhere on the sun. Uh, during the effort last year, when I when the um, primary mirror was actually recoated, we also fixed that problem with a new heat stop, and we are now able to point anywhere on the sun and um, and um, on the limb of the sun. So those problems have been solved um, since then. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, uh, Frederick, can I ask? Uh, Question. I don't sure. know whether it is uh, very relevant or not, but I'm just tempted to ask uh, because our telescope is designed with the off-axis configuration and it has a very low scattering and it's basically a very good uh, chronograph. So uh, do you think in future you would also possibly use it for nighttime application like direct imaging and so on? I'm sure people who work in nighttime astronomy would be probably eyeing on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you think so? Um, so there are some complications our, um, in, with regard to that. The telescope mm -hmm. certainly has that capability. Um, our operation scientist, Alexandra Tritschler, who is online, as far as I know, uh, uh, would be able to speak to that. She was also responsible for making sure that that capability exists, and it mm -hmm. does. Um, however, operating DKIST at night um, is, uh, is right now not part of our environmental impact study, which would have to be um, amended by that. Um, but uh, uh, that's uh, so I don't foresee us operating at night um, soon. So I think we do not have any more time for further questions, but I would request the participants to uh, again post their questions in our Slack channel and probably uh, we'll have uh, more discussions there. And so uh, I would like to thank Frederick once more for giving this very exciting talk. And uh, uh, so we had a long day with many remarkable sessions, including this one. And before we close today's proceeding, I just want to add that tomorrow's first session will begin at 9 a.m. in the morning, IST. And uh, we will see you tomorrow. So thanks for joining. So before I end, I want to know if SOC has any specific announcement to make? Raj Guru? No, I'd like to uh, thank all the speakers today. I think we had a very interesting session today. 
So yeah, so we have a little relaxed day tomorrow. So we'll come back at 9 a.m. instead of 7.30. So, so we will yeah. we'll open the Zoom meeting at 8.45 and uh, the sessions will start at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Yeah, so good night to folks in India and good morning and good evening to people who are elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.